Okay. It is my great pleasure to introduce Karen Johnson. Karen, um, don't feel like she has a question specifically to talk about. Um, she has a she also did a PhD system in technology. Um, she's got a bunch of really interesting work uh, that is really appreciated in my case. Vision and even getting his work today and in the back is encryption for Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation to, to come here. I'm always really happy to come back to Rutgers. Uh, this is really where I first discovered and fell in love with sociology as a discipline. So Rutgers has been really formative, uh, not just in my career trajectory, but really in, in shaping my intellectual health. Wait, but it's fun to be back here. Um, I am trained as a sociologist, and my background is specifically in the study of religion primarily. So I've been looking at identity formation and moral formation largely in religious and political communities. Um, and so my background isn't in education, it's not in the sciences. Uh, so I'm actually really excited to be here in part to learn from you all so in the Q&A um, that might help me think about gap years from a different perspective right now. The sociological lens on identity and moral formation is the kind of thing that I want to be able to use from a social perspective. Um, so I figured I'd start today with what, what is a gap year. Um, I didn't, I certainly didn't know about gap years when I was first thinking about the transition from high school to college. Um, but according to the Gap Year Association, a gap year is a semester or a year of experience learning that typically takes between high school and either post-secondary education or the start of your career in order to deepen one's practical, professional, and personal awareness. So this is a general definition and it can encompass a lot of different kinds of experiences. But what I found is that there are a few features that tend to be true of experiences that fall under this gap year umbrella. So the first is that gap years are intentional periods of time out. So students who are taking a gap year or adults who are taking a gap year are taking time out from what they perceive to be the kind of standard trajectory of college career. Um, and they're taking this time out with the intention of returning to that trajectory at the end of the so for example, students who start working right after high school, work for a few years, and down the road return to college, haven't taken gap years in the way that they should have been taking gap years. A second key factor is that people taking gap years are usually engaging in activities that are purposefully oriented towards self-reflection and towards exploration. Exploration of the world around them or exploration of potential career options. They're doing some type of activities that are supposed to help them figure out what they want to do in the next. And this relates to the final point, which is that gap years tend to occur at some type of critical juncture or turning point in the trajectory of the typical person's or career life. So most of the time, as this definition suggests, we think about gap years in college. But students are increasingly taking gap years in the middle of college. I have a student right now that I've been mentoring, just finished at Stanford, is now taking a gap year before deciding whether to go to graduate school or a career. I've seen gap year programs now marketed for people at midlife who are thinking about career changes and trying to think about what that might look like, as well as gap year programs marketed to people on the cusp of retirement who are thinking about what am I going to do in this next phase of my life. So, in my own research, I'm interested in a kind of narrower slice of that very broad field. I am interested in these more traditional gappers post high school and pre college. I'm also interested in structured gap year programs, formal programs for gap year students. So often when I tell people that I'm studying gap years, they think of young people backpacking around Europe or Southeast Asia and staying at hostels or surfing on beaches in Thailand. And that's not the type of activity that I'm interested in. Um, what's happened in the US context is that there's been the growth of highly structured programs for students to take this period of time off. And I'll talk about a few of those in a few minutes. I'm also interested only in US based providers, so organizations that have their headquarters in the US. 
And I'm only interested in programs that involve international travel for a period of at least one month in the program. Um, and that's largely because I'm interested in how cross cultural immersion, how cross cultural contact uh, shapes students' identity and the world formation of their so what I want to do uh, in my talk today is three things. First, I want to address the question of why gap years, why I think it's important to study gap years, why I became interested in them. I'll talk a little bit about um, the key components of my own ongoing research, and I'll spend the rest of my time outlining uh, both the explicit and implicit theories of transformative change or transformative learning that I found operating. So first, why gap years? There are actually three reasons that account for how I come to study gap years, especially out of the background of the study of religion and spirituality. Um, and three reasons why I think it represents an important topic for scholars of education in the US in particular, uh, uh, more generally. So the first reason for me is that I see gap years as a strategic research site for answering some of the bigger and more foundational questions that have driven my own research. So my interest in gap years was originally peaked while I was finishing up my PhD at Princeton. And I had students at the time who had participated in the Princeton Bridge Year program. So since 2009, students who are admitted to Princeton can apply to be a part of the Bridge Year program. If they're accepted, they defer their enrollment in Princeton for a full year, and then spend that first year, a full academic year, about eight months, living and working abroad in one of five countries. Bolivia, China, India, Indonesia, or Senegal. The Bridge Year program through Princeton is fully funded for admitted students, which is currently about 40 in each incoming class. Um, and it's run by an external gap year organization called Where There Be Divided. So, my conversations with these Bridge Year alumni, uh, besides being just a little bit jealous of the experience that they had, I was really struck by something else, which is how they talked about the impact of these. On them. And generally, they describe the gap year as a personally transformative experience. Um, they argue that they were fundamentally different people before they started than they were after, that it had changed the way they saw the world, that it had changed the way they saw themselves. And they, these individual narratives align with the way that the Bridge Year program, but also the way I found most gap year programs describe themselves, which is as a transformative experience. The language of transformation is very central to what gap year programs think they're doing. Now, for me, I was stuck, struck by these stories in large part because I'm fascinated more generally with Asian personal change and personal transformation. Um, this, for me, has become a unifying thread of my research agenda from my early work on religious conversion to my dissertation research on spiritual formation through practices like meditation and yoga. Each of these cases reveal kind of underlying interest in self formation, self discovery, and self transformation. And my focus on these occasions in particular is really driven by a belief that they allow us to see this dialectical relationship between the individual and society a bit more clearly. We can actually see how organizations and social contexts shape our identity and our experience, and ultimately how we act and what we do in the world. So I saw gap years as another space for me to look at some of these similar kinds of processes outside of the religious context. So I started looking around for information about gap years and gap and so the second reason I thought gap years was uh, an important place for inquiry is that it seems to be a growing educational space, a growing educational platform. Um, so it's very difficult, actually impossible right now, to say, to answer this question of how many people are attending gap year in the US context right now. There just really isn't good data. We have some information on deferral from within specific universities, some information about deferral for students who are involved colleges, for example, but we don't know broadly how many people are taking that. It's very hard to um, try and get to But there is some other evidence of growth. So um, one way you might think about this is just through Google Analytics. You can see there's been rising interest in terms of within the US searches for information about gap year programs. From 2004 to the present, there's been a slow but steady increase in interest. Um, this spike is in May 2016, gap year professionals call that the Malia Obama effect. <laughs> um, so that's the month she announced she would be taking a gap year before going to Harvard. So 
vitamins or what does that mean? <laughs> in my own informal conversations with people about this project, I keep hearing that more and more high schools, um, especially elite private schools, well resourced public schools, those high, those high school college counselors are talking about gap years as an alternative option alongside college and universities. Um, so many young people are much more aware of this as an option. Two other indications of growth in the field. Uh, first, there's been increasing demand for and attendance at what are called the USA Gap Year Fair. This is an annual circuit of events held between January and March of each year um, that bring together providers, students, consultants, and uh, gap year professionals. Uh, it started in 2008 with the first year these fairs were held. There was a state across the country. In 2019, there was 40 fairs held in 20 different and more than 100 gap year program providers participated, and about 6,000 potential gap year representatives attended. Another uh, bit of evidence about growth is the establishment of the Gap Year Association. It was founded in 2012, and the GYA serves as a kind of hub for resources and information about gap year programs, but it also serves as a central standard setting and communication organization uh, for providers in the field. It also promotes and conducts research and strives through scholarships to make gap years accessible to a broader range of students. Uh, the GYA also now holds annual conferences. The 2019 conference was actually just last week at the <coughs> So part of the, the, the drive behind the establishment of GYA has actually been the proliferation of gap year provider organizations. So this is just a sample of some of the US-based organizations that offer gap year programs. As of September 2019, the GYA has 55 active program provider members, 25 of which are formally accredited by the organization. So all of the programs listed here are US-based organizations. All of them have explicitly marketed gap year programs, and all of them, uh, their programs include international travel. Uh, perhaps one of the best indicators that gap years are becoming not only more popular, but also more legitimate as an option for college bound young adults in the US is that they're being endorsed and encouraged by colleges and universities. Now, well, Harvard College is probably the most well known for this. They claim as far back as the 1970s to have been encouraging young people to take a gap year. Uh, but as right now on their admissions page, you can find information in their admissions letter. They explicitly mention gap years as an option that is those students should consider. Um, and just a few years ago, Bill Fitzsimmons, the dean of admissions at Harvard, wrote a uh, high, widely circulated op ed where he encouraged the champions of the idea of taking that off. Uh, Millbury College, Colorado College, among a number of others, also explicitly encouraged to provide resources for gap years. Um, beyond this, a small but growing number of universities like Princeton are offering their own gap year <coughs> programs. So Tufts One Plus Four program, as well as Norbert University's Leap Year program, follow a very similar year-long academic model. Uh, UNC, Chapel Hill, Florida State University, just as of this year, their first program year at Duke University, have a gap year fellowship program, where students who uh, receive the fellowship get a stipend somewhere between five and fifteen thousand dollars that they can apply to whatever activities that they choose to partake in during their gap year within uh, but they can apply it to these external organizations or they can design their own travel experience on that needs some type of basic education foundation. So the gap year field is growing and diversifying um, and to help students navigate some of this complexity to decide what programs might be right for them, there's also been the rise of gap year consultants, a subset of educational consultants who specialize in gap year so these are just a few of the 20 registered members, uh, consultant members of the Gap Year Association from the US. So most of these organizations that I've talked about, whether they're providers, consultants, and even the Gap Year Association itself are relatively recent phenomenon. Um, recently, I helped run a, a state of the field survey for the Gap Year Association, um, and we found that more than 50% of respondents ran their first gap year program in or after 2010, and nearly a third ran their first program in 2015 or later. So 
this is a relatively new, um, but also appears to be a growing educational field. So of course, this is a question, which is why all this class is about gap years. Why are students interested in it? Why are colleges and universities actually endorsing this as an educational option? Uh, and part of the reason is because gap year providers and staff make big claims about the impact that gap year programs can have on young people, about the benefits that um, accrue to people who take this, this year off. Um, but this brings me, yeah, it brings me to my third and final point uh, about why gap years are important to study, and that's because there really is not much research on gap year programs and their impact. When my students at Princeton first sparked my interest, I took the academic and started looking around for research and found very little, especially in the American context, that was rigorous academic research on impact. There have been a couple of studies. One of the most widely cited in the field um, is Joe O'Shea's book published in 2013 called Gap Year. Uh, his work is based on largely on interview data, largely with UK-based Gapper students, mostly from a single Gap Year organization in the UK. And he, was, he outlined some of the main motivations that students cite for taking a gap year, as well as some of the impact that they talk about. A very similar book by Carl Hagler and Ray Nelson, also published in 2013, has a similar format and methodology that focuses on American gap year students. And their findings largely mirror those that are shown in terms of both intention and outcome. And then, probably the most widely cited. Uh, Piece of research and often used to justify the value of taking the gap year is a 2015 uh, national alumni survey that was run by the Gap Year Association in collaboration with Nina Ho, who's an academic researcher at Princeton University. Um, and they find that respondents report that they're more mature, more confident, more motivated, and have a clearer sense of direction and purpose after their gap year. The data also suggests that they have higher GPAs, faster graduation rates, and higher levels of civic and political engagement than their peers. So while informative, these studies have serious methodological shortcomings. All three rely solely on post hoc data collection, where they are asking former gappers to reflect backwards on their experience and to report on um, its perceived impact. Of course, the better test these self-reports, we need pre and post program data collection points. We also need research that utilize, utilizes more relevant reference groups or comparison groups. Many gap year advocates use data like the survey to suggest that gappers are different in these ways from the average college student. But of course, we know with self selection and also program selection that these gappers are already different in a myriad of ways from uh, the average college student. And even if we take for granted that these that gap years produce many of the changes they report to, we don't really know how. There's been almost no research into what the pedagogical reasons and mechanisms underlying some of these changes. So my own research, of course, has been trying to fill some of these gaps. Um, although, as you can probably tell, part of my goal is just to advocate for additional research. There's so much work to be done in this field, um, and not a lot of folks doing it um, for free retail. Uh, but so my own research has largely taken a two-pronged approach. So I have focused at the field level, just trying to understand who is in the gap year field, who are the key players, um, who are the most prominent voices, and what are they saying? What are the, the discourses about what's happening in the gap year field? How are they being marketed? How are they being talked about? What is the logic behind the structure of some of these programs? So I've been analyzing uh, organizational materials, talking with trip leaders and staff from programs around the country. But the other problem, and what I'm most focused on right now, is a uh, longitudinal in depth case study of a single gap year provider called Global Citizen Year. And they're based out of Oakland, California. And right now, they send 150 students per year. To four different countries, in Ecuador, Brazil, Senegal, and India. Students very similar to the Princeton program, they spend eight months living and working at some of these volunteer work in the local community. They live with a homestay family um, in the country that they're staying in. Um, they take formal language classes. They also participate in formal programs through the organization itself. And all of Global Citizen Year Scholars are between high school and college. So I'm currently following the 2019-2020 cohort of fellows um, from admission through to re-entry. So this past summer, I sampled 40 of the 150 students, so I'll be following this in-depth interview at four different data collection points. There is a summer pre-departure. Next month, I'll start mid-program interviews. 
next summer I'll follow up with them again when they after they return home. Kind of go to college. After they've had their first week of college, um, to try and track some of the more long term impacts that they will be experiencing. I'm also conducting field work or just an observation on program, both domestically. Uh, they hold their pre travel and re entry training programs in California and also uh, abroad as they follow their students in their after work program. So I've spent six of the past eight weeks in Ecuador and I'll return to that country for each of the four month programming periods between now and April when the program ends. So my goal is to understand uh, whether and in what ways these programs impact participants and also to identify some of the mechanisms how these changes need to be. Uh, given, some, given the fact that I'm relatively early in the case study, I can't answer these questions definitively yet. So what I want to do today is instead to focus from the perspective of providers of these programs. Um, as I noted at the beginning of my talk, the language of transformation is what first attracted me to gap here. And as I've looked more formally and more formally analyzed the legal markets to help gap this program, I found that the language of transformation is really central uh, to providers. Uh, vision of what it is that they're doing. So here's a screenshot of the home page of Carpe Diem, one of these organizations, emphasizing that they inspire growth and transformation. This is a picture I took from the marketing materials sent by Amigos de las Americas to interested students. But again, claim Amigos has a transformative impact. So what I want to do today is to consider this emphasis on personal transformation, not just as an inflated marketing rhetoric. Which it might be hard to ask for, um, but as a reflection of the actual ambitions, the real aspirations of these organizations um, to bring about deep and meaningful change in their programs. And so I want to look at what is the nature of the change that these gap year programs are hoping to bring about, and how do they think that they can push to be So, drawing on all the data I've collected so far from the field and from my case study, I want to Describe and identify some of these theories of transformative change. In doing so, I'm going to draw on a conceptual framework uh, introduced by John Levinson in 2017, based on a, his study of three Jewish educational programs that have similar types of um, aspirations to transformative impact and transformative meaning. So in that case, so I'm going to argue that alongside the Mesero model of transformative education, there are actually a number of other ways that we should be thinking about the aspiration to bring about these dramatic impacts on both character and identity. So Levinson finds that some of the Jewish educational programs that um, he studied have a model of change very similar to Mesero. He calls it productive comfort, but it relies on challenges and uncomfortable experiences and disorienting dilemma. In order to promote largely cognitive changes, shifts in perspective from one point of view or frame of reference to another. But Levinson also identifies that there are a few other kinds of models uh, of transformative change, and each of them has a different set of aims or goals, what constitutes change, and a different set of mechanisms or processes that bring those changes about. So, in my own research, I found that these are useful models for thinking about the diverse range of goals. Uh, and that are relevant to the gap year program. So I found that a very similar model to the productive discomfort one is the more explicit uh, pedagogical model that's referenced in the gap year review. This is the one they tend to talk about the most. But I've also found that more implicitly, these other models are also operating. We can see evidence of that model that program is designed in the way that the providers talk about what their goals are. So I found in my research, both attending these annual gap year conferences, looking through programmatic materials, talking um, with staff and trip leaders, that there are two kind of key concepts or ideas taken from out of the learning sciences that they tend to use to justify the program structure and the impact of that perspective. So the first is the model of experience. This is not surprising. Many of these programs come out of knolls and outward bounds, the outdoor adventure education programs that have relied on these type of education models for much longer. So this, this model is, is a common point of reference for providers in the field, for professionals in the field. They talk about it at conferences, in their curricular materials, it's a central orienting point of reference. 
In fact, in the Global Citizen Year program, the first two weeks, the students are actually shown this model, um, this exact image, as a way to justify the Global Citizen Year program. <laughs> the second kind of key concept within the field is the idea of the structure. So this is regularly used, repeatedly used within grad professional mm -hmm. field, um, suggesting that learning and growth are most likely to happen in the stretch zone, uh, the area of novelty, exploration, and adventure. Gap year providers often talk about pushing students into their stretch zone, encouraging them to explore new things and push their existing boundaries. But equally importantly, they're interested in making sure students are actually making sure that they aren't too scared, distracted, or overwhelmed by these cross-cultural experiences uh, that no one can actually have. So this kind of Goldilocks left principle of uh, the stretch zone is also used to justify why formal programs and organizations are necessary rather than self-designed itineraries. It's the staff that help make sure that students are staying in the zone. So the goal of all of this these challenges and these, these challenging experiences is to bring about shifts in perspective. And ultimately, we believe that one of the photos is perspective shifts and some critical reflections that students are taking home uh, to embody and cherish. When I talk to trip leaders and program staff about what are the lessons, the perspective that they most hope students take away, most of them reference this idea of a, of a global perspective or a broader perspective. So Laura, a trip leader from Carpe Diem, for example, says, I would hope that my students will walk away with just a broader perspective of the other ways that people choose to live, the other ways that people look at the world, but they have a little bit more patience and caution and curiosity to those alternative lifestyles. Mark, an instructor from Where There Be Dragons, um, expresses a very similar sentiment, which is especially for students from the US, having them shift their perspective and realize that almost everybody in the world doesn't actually see the US as the center of the universe would be one of the biggest things we're hoping to achieve. And to realize that there are other ways of living that are just as valid. So explicitly, uh, the dominant theory of transformative change in the gap year field scope is this. Students have exposure to cultural difference, um, which can be challenging. It can sometimes generate discomfort, fear. Students initially often react with fear, disgust, anger, confusion, anxiety. But these experiences are then become the topic of explicit reflection um, and discussion on the program. And students are guided by staff towards different ways of thinking about these forms of cultural behavior at the same time. Ideally, this leads to a more nuanced perspective on the world, on their host culture, on their home culture, on themselves. So in line with this model of transformative change, most gap year programs include some element, uh, some combination of experiences that are meant to push students into their stretch down to have these uncomfortable experiences. Whether that's living with uh, homestay families, the internships that they teach on the local community, or different forms of outdoor adventure experiences. Processing on these programs occurs individually. Most students are encouraged to journal, to blog. They also have it through one on one mentoring and coaching with staff um, and through larger guided discussions with their peers on the program. So, Global Citizen Year, for example, we just finished those it's about two weeks into the, or two months into the program right now. Um, so the first six weeks of the program is organized around what they call the catch and release approach to cultural immersion. Uh, so the students are moving between the safety and comfort of being with their peers and the staff, and then cycling into periods of immersion. So they come back, process, and reflect, and they go back out. And um, so the goal of this is to establish a comfort zone with their peers of the staff members so they can come back to um, and reflect. And then when they're in their immersion, they're in that stretch zone. But when they come back to debrief, they can reflect on and give meaning to those experiences, the challenges they encountered there um, in particular ways. So just last week, uh, I was at the second debrief circle, so the end of the program launch period. And staff were having students reflect on some of the challenges. Some of the things they were noticing that was different about Ecuadorian culture. And students highlighted a range of differences, things like you don't have to wait until everyone is served to eat in Ecuador. Uh, there's very different standards of independence and maturity for Ecuadorian teenagers than there are in the US. And at this stage, students sometimes describe these differences in ways that were somewhat judgmental. 
their reflections often reveal the you know, underlying assumption that their way of doing things is better, um, and that the equilibrium and is here is just wrong. Staff then are trying to guide students towards thinking about these things as culturally relative. So, for example, one of the students noticed that in Ecuador, you don't say bless you or salute to someone after they sneeze. She reported that during work the first week, she said it and everyone laughed at her. She had to go home after and ask her sister why that was. Another student in the group said he had also noticed this, and he said, it kind of pisses me off. Like, I say it to people, and they don't say thank you. Uh, and so the staff were kind of pushing him to think about how he was using his own cultural values to interpret the behavior of other people, to get him to reflect on why it might make him angry that people don't say thank you. Throughout this conversation, the staff were pushing students to be curious, to ask questions about why Ecuadorian people in their homestay families are doing the things that they're doing. What is the history? What is the culture? What is the context in which these different behavioral norms grew about? So for staff, these conversations are key mechanisms in facilitating personal change. As David told me when we, one of the staff members told me when we sat down for a formal interview, he said, you don't just learn from being in a place. You learn from thinking about that and figuring it out. And asking these questions about how it challenges, in what ways it challenges, how you have made sense. So the explicit model of change um, mirrors this idea of productive discomfort. They're using these um, challenges around cultural difference and helping to guide students towards a more culturally realistic perspective. But Gap Year providers and staff also have a, a range of other kinds of goals. So it's small for you to see, but Global Citizen Year, for example, this global perspective is just one of many learning outcomes that they're interested in. Um, so they're also interested in cultivating things like resilience, self-awareness, empathy, curiosity, um, and a range of other more personal characteristics. So I want to turn now to some of the other models, the Levinson Institute. So the first alternative model of transformative change um, is what Levinson calls uh, the Mammonized model. And this is named after a Jewish thinker well known for his teachings on the development of moral character. So in this model, the target of change is not frames of through cognitive frames of reference, but rather values, habits, and dispositions, the core elements of moral character. And in this model, transformation is accomplished not through disorienting dilemmas or challenges, but through regular and consistent forms of practice. So ideally, this practice occurs under supervision in a relatively sheltered environment. But over time, it's assumed that these practices will actually change um, the character of the so in Levinson's words, he writes, this model is about learning a habit such that over time, one incorporates that habit into one's character. So again, I want to use Global Citizen Year Hut here as a model, or an example of, of how this works. So Global Citizen Year participants are expected um, to act in accordance with a set of agreed upon behavioral standards called the GCBs, the Global Citizen Year Behavior, while they're on program. And these GCBs are introduced to students during the first week of the program um, as the community's DNA, which provides the foundation for the next DNA. The GCBs provide students with a shared conceptual framework for thinking about what constitutes good behavior under the model of global citizenship. The program also helps to facilitate behavior in alignment through creating a community of accountability. Staff students to live up to these values, and eventually the, their peers do as well. Even in the first few weeks of the program, for example, I encourage students giving school reminders of what the GCB behavior. Um, so while these were often kind of comments that were made somewhat in jest, I think they also point to the fact that these values can come um, to play a role as like a framework for making sense of behavior and for deciding on lives of action. So these values are about expectations for how students will behave on program, but they're also the outcomes, the learning outcomes that you see by hope to create this position of gratitude for the outcome of something that can become habit or aspect of student character. And they do this in part by allowing students opportunities to practice doing empathy and doing gratitude on the program. So for example, one of the reflection activities and techniques is a practice called prompting. Resolution um, or conflict management approaches. There's four steps where students just vent 
and I was just talk about like annoying them, and bothering them, and like, challenging. But then the second step is that they're supposed to own. They're supposed to own their own role, their own role in creating whatever problem um, they might be having. This is about accountability. It's about responsibility. Uh, and then the third step, they do the moccasins or empathize in some cases. But they actually are asked to envision the challenge from the other. Um, and in, in doing so, they make empathy a kind of core feature of how students are reflecting on issues and challenges. In the final stage, students make a plan of how they're going to handle that situation or a similar situation, taking initiative to prevent problematic encounters moving forward. So, under supervision, and while in the, the kind of comfort zone, bumping is a chance for students to practice doing accountability and doing empathy. It's a space to work on cultivating uh, habits and dispositions of empathy and initiative that GCY aims to develop. Bumping itself is also a transportable skill that students can use on their own to reflect on their experiences with their team leaders when they're in one on one mentoring sessions and with their peers when they're talking about their experiences. So, in this model, the program provides students with um, the program provides students with conceptual frameworks, what values are important. It provides them with practical tools for enacting those shared values. And then it provides repeated opportunities for students to practice uh, behaving in those ways. The goal over time is that things like empathy and accountability or gratitude become habits, um, aspects that are enacted without having to actually walk through. The second alternative model proposed by Levinson is what he calls the paradise in exile model. In this model, the target of learning is actually participants' aspirations. In other words, transformation occurs in relation to what participants want to see or how they want um, or what they hope to become. In terms of process, the model tends to work by providing participants with a taste or a model um, of an ideal way of being in the world while simultaneously creating a desire to replicate that ideal in the program. So as Levinson writes, these programs aspire for participants to be changed into seekers, people who have glimpsed the kind of ideal and then go through life trying to replicate or recreate that ideal in some way. In the Jewish educational programs that Levinson studied, the ideal that he found being sought was a model of community or a way of being in relationship. Doing these programs is one of the factors. These kinds of multivocal, pluralistic, intellectual and emotional kinds of communities that they seek on these fellowship programs. That model of what a community like that takes like, feel like, act like, something that imprints itself on their mind and they'll find themselves recreating in their mind. So in my own research, I found that there are two different kinds of aspirations that these programs tend to impart. Similar to the fellowship program studied by Levinson, Gapner participants also experience a way of relating to others and of what it means to be in community while in a program that's different from what they've experienced before. Most programs have relatively small instructor to student ratios, usually eight to ten to one. Um, and students build up very close bonds, often through these very kind of things uh, with one another. The program itself has ex is formed around activities. Um, it requires students to be vulnerable and open to contact. The norms of these contexts require that students be mutually supportive and not in competition with one another, but they embrace and value difference and diversity um, of opinion rather than consensus. So many of the program participants have never experienced this way of relating to others. Um, a few weeks into the program, for example, several of the students commented to me that they felt closer to these other fellows that they just known for two weeks. Than people who were their best friends back home, people they knew for more than a decade. In my conversations this last summer with alumni from the program who had just started college, I learned that they were having a really hard time finding people that they felt they could relate to. They thought that their peers weren't interested in the kind of depth of relationship or the depth of conversation that they had gotten used to while on their campus program. So, in addition to this vision of community, um, that students end up trying to replicate when they get home. Uh, gap year programs also shape more individual level aspirations. In other words, they tend to transmit a shared vision of what it means uh, to live a good and successful life. 
And I found that passion is really the foundational ideal for aspiration at the individual level in the gap year community. Passion is described as the foundational marker of a good life. People who are passionate and have pursued their passion are admired um, and I see an idea. So this vision of the good life was transmitted both through explicit discourse, which um, constructed passion as, as a primary foundation, and also through exposure to people who serve as role models, examples of people who have pursued um, their passions. So this is a slide taken Ethan Knight, who's the um, founder of the Gap Year Association, also of RBCM, one of the providers. His tagline is passion is a better predictor of success than IQ will ever be. And this is a regularly repeated sentiment within the field in general and also within Global Citizen Year. Um, Abby Salik, the founder and CEO of Global Citizen Year, also regularly reinforces this value of passion, encouraging students to find their passion while they're on program and then to live their lives in pursuit of it. Um, when she addressed students in the first week of the program, telling the story of the development of Global Citizen Year, she constructs it as the um, product of her own passion. So during college, I would write down all the ideas and experiences that I've had that really lit me up. Um, and Global Citizen Year was constructed as a product of those um, passions. They also bring in external speakers who serve as role models. They reinforce um, the value of passion, both in the way that they talk about their own values, but also as living examples of people who have pursued their passions, even when it means going against the expectations. So as a foundation for transformation, these aspirations are uh, really work to change behavior only when they're internalized. Um, some of my interviews with alumni from the Global Citizen Year program suggest that many students do in fact internalize passion as an important marker of the good life. Um, so I was talking to Faith this summer and she was telling me about how she shifted her sense of what she wanted to do for her career. She said, you know, so previously she thought she wanted to be a dental hygienist, but she argues that it was actually outside forces that had pushed her in that direction. And it was during the fall of her gap year when she was leaving for India, but she started to think, you know, I think that would be a crappy life. And a crappy life defined as pursuing a career that's safe and financially stable, but that she isn't driven about, right? So this drive, this uh, shift from assessing potential career options based on financial stability, um, on safety, to thinking about it in terms of what is life, what makes me passionate, what life you run. So under this model, the target of transformation is participants' aspirations, who they want to be and how they want to live. And if internalized, these new aspirations can continue to influence and shape students' behavior long after the program has ended, acting as a kind of measuring stick for them to evaluate different lines of action, or as a kind of compass orienting them towards some path, but not others. Okay. Now the final model outlined by Levinson is the outsider to insider model. And in this model, the target of learning or transformation is participant social identity. The primary aim is to foster both confidence and commitment to whatever identity is most relevant to your so in Levinson's words, transformation under this model involves moving from a sense of fraudulence to a sense of confidence within a particular domain and learning to see oneself differently as a result. So in the Jewish educational programs we studied, for example, the goal was to help participants feel confident thinking about themselves as Jewish people and to get them to feel a sense of attachment to that identity. In my own research, um, I similarly found that leadership is a key goal for many of these gap year programs. Global Citizen Year, in fact, pitches itself as a, as a leadership development program, and many of the other programs also have leadership core components. Um, the goal is to produce confident and competent leaders. Um, but they also aim to create global citizens, people who feel confident as world travelers, uh, people who can move between different cultural contexts. Um, and who see the world as composed of people who share as many different systems. So confidence and commitment in these identities are built up in a variety of ways. Um, in terms of leadership, students in the program are repeatedly told that they were selected because of their leadership potential, 
is fighting against imposter syndrome until you were accepted for a reason. That's our leadership. Um, they also take surveys and questionnaires throughout the program that help them identify what their style of leadership is uh, through coaching and mentoring and experiencing experiences. Um, they're encouraged to think about themselves as a leader, um, even if that doesn't mean leadership in the traditional style. They're taught that leadership is a process, not a position. They don't have to be in a formal position of leadership to think about themselves as leaders. Um, and this was, was really the primary, one of the most important goals for staff and for providers. But in my conversations with gap year students, it's often this sense of themselves as travelers, as global citizens, that stands out the most. Um, when I talk to students after the fact, one of the changes, the ways in which they feel confident is actually just their ability to travel, to navigate the world. Um, the one student asked told me, I feel like I can survive anywhere under any circumstance. She has the confidence no matter what surrounding she's in. Nicholas told me that he has big plans to go backpacking. He wants to backpack around the world. But I just feel a lot more confident at the time of all um, to just take a backpack and go around the world, hitchhiking or whatever. Uh, Faith told me when I asked her what she wanted to do and how she imagined herself 10 years from now, that definitely out of the country. She has to be traveling. She doesn't know where her career is going to be going, but for sure, it needs to happen. These students feel so confident at traveling and encountering different contexts in the world, and they also have a desire to do that. They want to continue to travel and work abroad um, later in their lives. So teaching students to, to be travelers and decidedly not tourists, I think that's a little bit of boundary work we need on there, um, is accomplished through a kind of apprenticeship. Students are new to the program. Uh, in the beginning, they're largely the recipients of programming. Uh, staff are designing all of their travel experiences. But as they move through the program, they also take on more responsibilities for planning travel and for planning programming. Uh, so in the beginning, their host families are literally walking them to the bus stop and showing them how to get on the bus. And by the end of the program, they're designing an independent travel week. Um, where they travel on their own. They develop an itinerary that gets approved by staff. But it's teaching them skills related to travel and the confidence to be able to do that. And by the end of the program, many students and students back to feel both confident um, and capable of designing international travel experiences of their own. So get your providers and staff claim and desire to facil facilitate a number of different kinds of change. While explicitly the primary change being brought is really one of this transformation towards a more potentially relative perspective. Gap year programs also care a lot about facilitating changes in participants' character, in their habits, in their dispositions, in participants' aspirations, what they value, uh, what they're trying to achieve, and in their social identity, shaping both commitment to and confidence in their identity as leaders, as travelers, and school. So stepping back, these different models can help us see that transformation takes a number of different forms and can occur through a variety of means. In practice, of course, these models often operate in tandem. Most gap year programs have multiple goals, multiple approaches, even individual lesson plans and activities can draw on multiple um, But I believe that, uh, as Levinson has argued here, that educational organizations that are seeking transformative change really need to clearly specify what they're trying to achieve and how they're trying to do it. Right now, most gap year providers are setting a really broad range of learning goals and outcomes, and they rely on somewhat vague references to experiential learning theory to explain and justify the curriculum structure. I think more clearly to contain some of these different forms of change that they're trying to accomplish and the pedagogical methods that's underlying them can help them generate or create programs that more clearly align with the program and the outcomes that they're interested in or want to get those um, So we definitely need more research in the field on program impact and program efficacy. But before we do that, we need to understand um, what it means to be successful from a provider perspective um, and what those providers think that success is actually going to like on the process. So my hope is that this is the first step in that direction for actually laying out what some of the theories and practices of transformative change are within the gap year program. 
So, again, yeah, this is hard to say because again, there's not good data. Um, there's no central program. But in general, they're relatively optimal. Um, this is not true for the program I'm studying, which is one of the weird fields in terms of quality of for students. So, they actually are able to recruit a very diverse um, set of students. This is not true for me. But Global Citizen is the organization I'm studying about. A third of the students get full scholarships, as we can talk about now. Um, another third get partial aid, and then we need about a third of the full, the full price tag, which is 32%. Um, so, the first time I heard of like a gap year was when I was studying abroad in like 2005, and it was like Australia's. I gave one time guess a common um, global ticket or something like that that they're. Um, High school graduation and travel around the world. Um, from what you're talking about, I still don't see the difference between just that and this, in the sense of I'm still not clear on what kind of volunteering they do, where they stay. Like, are the so you said that before? Are they staying in like poor neighborhoods of White Hill, or are they staying in poor neighborhoods in Quito or um, like Kumbaya, places like that? And then, what kind of volunteer work do they do? And afterwards, it seems like no one specifically spoke about volunteering to help their people. Like, when you interview people, they talked about travel, which is great, but no one spoke about, like, what in the, you know what I mean, like, make a more just world of some sort. So I was kind of confused what the point of the Like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was a good question. So, um, in Ecuador, there's two program paths. They tend to be placed a bit more rurally, so outside the major city. Um, they live with host families who, from what I can tell and from what staff has said, are like lower middle class within the overall country. Um, and their volunteer placements, they do a range of things that varies by country, depending on what kinds of activities are most available. So in India, for example, all students work with Teacher India, um, which is America. Um, and so they're all teaching English. Uh, in Ecuador, there's a mixture. Some are teaching English. Some students who are working at an after-school program, so they're doing like music and art education. Um, some are working, one's working for a tourist agency, helping with marketing. Um, some are working for um, the local municipality, doing like translation or radio stations doing some translation work. Depends in part on my numbers. In Brazil, there's a lot more conservation. Um, so students do talk about volunteering um, as well. But I think one of the things I'm finding interesting and perhaps not surprising is that the programs do select on the outcomes they're interested in pursuing. So, for example, students who do volunteer work or service work in high school end up being selected for these programs. So they talk about service as an important part of their lives. But in some ways, it already was. Um, one thing I think these programs do well is that they talk about uh, learning service rather than doing service. So they um, they place service within a framework. Even in global citizen, they call them apprenticeships, uh, where they're they spend like they're learning from the people in Ecuador as much as, if not more than, what they are bringing. Like these are 18 um, So they don't have much to offer in a lot of ways. Um, and they're, and they're taught that, right? That they, they don't have that much to offer. So they should be um, And so I think that component does help shift. Some of them do come in with a sense of they want to save the, the, the world, or right? they want to help these poor Ecuadorians, but they're really shifting, shift that perspective through the program. Is it the American organization being very careful, hopefully, of the lens that they give to these host cultures, or do the people there control that? So it's a mixture. Um, 
head, the headquarters in Oakland has, does have a lot of control over the formal programming and content, but the local staff are um, mostly at the Oakland. Uh, so the, the trip leaders and the staff that students have the most direct contact with, more than half of them are from Ecuador. Um, so there is a mixture in, in, in position from the top and a, and a willingness to work from the bottom up. Um, and the program is relatively flexible. Um, they do kind of tailor it to whatever seems to be emerging as important in their experience. So just a couple weeks ago, for those of you that don't know, there was nationwide protests in Ecuador. It closed down all the country. It actually forced the program to postpone significant aspects of its programming. Students were stuck in their home states for 12 days. Um, and the second debriefing circle kind of shifted to focus around that. What is the politics of this? What is the history of this? What can we learn about differences in the politics and social movements between the US and Ecuador from, from being a part of that? Um, of building on comments that have already been uh, mentioned. I know this, uh, there's a straight book called Postcolonial Perspectives on Global Citizenship Education. And so just <laughs> some thoughts that um, come from that. Like first, what does it mean? I know that this is not, Global Citizen is the name of the particular agency you study, but I do feel like gap year programs in general are kind of global citizenship education. That's the global citizenship education. What does it it's just bringing into question what does it mean to be a global citizen. And so these rather privileged um, students from the North are going sort of to, cap and it kind of becomes like, I think you did define global citizen as global travelers, people who have this cultural competence, cultural awareness. And so what this post-colonial perspective in this book was um, having us interrogate was how these privileged uh, students from the North are going to reap all the benefits from this engagement. They get passion, drive, empathy, cultural competence, transformation, confidence, all of these things. But the people that they're interacting with are completely invisible, like even in your presentation, <laughs> as it's sort of been mentioned. So that what are they getting? They are also global citizens, and what does it mean to be a global citizen? And even the word transformation, it's so individual, it's about the individual's personal transformation and not really about the social transformation. Like the critical consciousness, critical awareness of severe global inequalities and global injustice. And so sort of where is that critical consciousness education that's not even part of any of the curriculum? And then how, how do they emerge from these experiences becoming champions for justice, for global justice work? So, yeah. yeah, no, thank you for that comment. Um, I think I think what you're saying is, is an accurate like reflection on the state of the program. Um, and my sense is that part of the reason that that is true is that some of these programs have tried really hard to get away from the idea that they're like going to help. The other person that they've gone so far in the other direction that the only thing they focus on is the benefit to this thing out of a desire not to do this, like, like they did. Um, and so I think in some ways they've gone too far in that direction. Also, the program that I'm studying um, partly is based on um, the founder and CEO has an MBA uh, from Harvard Business School. I think we see a lot of this like um, leadership very individualized understanding of leadership, of entrepreneurial decision, um, <laughs> among students um, that can be, that leads in the direction of understanding of how you think about change. So that you become aware that you create some type of assumption. Also, the group around the culture of Silicon Valley, too, the organization is based in Oakland. So I think there's a lot of that underlying. Um, that's not true of all of all of the gap year providers, I think there is a mix where some that, that social justice framework is much more foregrounded than it is. So, let's see what we can say. 
information that you have. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it does. I certainly hope it does. Um, and my background kind of coming out of the study of those just contact, I see a lot of similarities um, in, in terms of the process, right? Of people speaking to become better a lot of the reason why people enter religious communities, why they take up spiritual practices, um, it's a lot of the motivation for the students going into these programs that they want to become better people and better versions of themselves. Um, and these organizations, these practices are facilitators of that movement. Um, and part of what I'm trying to show also that they, a lot of the, the rhetoric is that they allow people to become what they are, but they also have a very particular vision of what they um, it might not be as like explicitly the theological as a religious context, um, but they have a vision, um, and they want students to embrace that vision um, and to live a life that um, And so, in, in a lot of ways, I do, I do see similarities, um, and I certainly have felt the effects of the way the PhD program <laughs> socializes you to a very particular like that. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, I think there, there can be a lot of Yeah, I think it's nice. 